thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, uh, are there any Vietnam veterans here? Thank you for your service. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, read this to keep us on time. It, it takes about uh, 35 minutes and then to make sure that we stay on time and then we can have a dialogue if you would like, questions and answers, those kinds of things. Yeah, okay. So let's get started. There's an old story about a private in the infantry who fought in the Pacific Theater in World War II and when he returned home, he was asked by a local women's club to give a talk about the Grand War in the Pacific. His response was, lady, I only knew the war as it looked from my foxhole. Well, tonight, I'd like to go a little broader than a foxhole and give you the experiences of the infantry battalion that I served with in their three years and three months of combat in the Vietnam War. I want to take you on this journey because a number of historians who have read my book have told me that our experiences in my battalion were actually a microcosm of the Vietnam War itself. I spent more than a decade documenting the experiences of my battalion, the 5th of the 46th Infantry Battalion, 198th Light Infantry Brigade of the AmeriCal Division, which was in Vietnam from March 1968 until early May 1971. The battalion fought in three of the four types of terrain that were encountered in the war. The coastal lowlands, the Piedmont, and the mountains. This excludes the large Mekong Delta south of Saigon, which only had one American Army Division stationed there in the war, because that was all that was needed for the threat there, and the logistical burden was very large to sustain any soldiers serving there at all. So that's way down south. Uh, but everybody else dealt with the terrain and the circumstances that I'm going to talk to, uh, to you about tonight. To begin with, a quick reference of where we were would be helpful to place into context what we experience. As you know, South Vietnam was composed of 44 provinces, very analogous to our states, and the district around Saigon, much like Washington, D.C. The American military divided the country into core boundaries. A core consists of, consists of two or more divisions. The assignments began with the first corps up north, composed of five provinces, beginning with Quang Nai in the south, and you see the thick red line. These are your core boundaries right here. Okay, so up here where, it's where I was, Quang Nai is the first province, and I'm going to take you up north. <coughs> So if you start at the north, along North Vietnam, uh, we had uh, Quang Tin, Quang Nam, Thoa Tien, and Quang Tri province, which bordered the demilitarized zone and North Vietnam. Now Quang Nai province, on the southern edge of that uh, core boundary, was one of the most hostile, pro hostile provinces in the war, accounting for 6% of all American combat deaths, especially along its coastal plains where the scourge of mines was horrendous. And this is where I was in Quang Nai. It's also worth noting that in the Vietnam War, only 10 out of the 44 total provinces, only 10 accounted for 50% of all combat deaths. And the five of those provinces were the ones that we had up there in the first core area. And the terrain that we faced was just as challenging as the enemy. The political structure of South Vietnam is also important to understand the context of the war. Within each province, there were district towns. Quang Nai province, where I served, had three, Binh San, Son Tin, and Duc Pho. Within each town were political villages. These were not physical locations, uh, but political divisions of the hamlets. So if a Vietnam that refers to entering into a, a village or a ville, okay? He's really not talking about a village per se. Uh, he's actually talking about a sub-hamlet within the village. The village is a political structure. Within that, you have hamlets, these small little thing, uh, areas, groupings that we're going to talk about, and where you might have six or 13 dwellings, okay? So 
let's go further, a little further. I don't want to confuse people. Binson District, where our battalion spent a lot of its time, was divided into several village structures. Again, these are political divisions, not physical villages. And I'll take one, San Mai, because it will lead us to the, Viet the My Lai hamlets, which are universally known because of the atrocity that occurred there. Within the political division of the San Mai village, and again, that's a political designation, there were several hamlet groups. And here you can see uh, the Milais, the Mai Kays, and the Koh Lois. Okay. Then within those, you get right down here, which is the meat of uh, what soldiers saw, and those are the hamlets themselves. I mentioned the Milais because of the Milai massacre. People are familiar with that. And there were uh, five, uh, six sub-hamlet groups here, Milai 1, Milai 2, so forth and so on. Now, these sub-hamlets are where the Vietnamese peasant actually lived. The sub-hamlet of My Lai 4 is where most of the killing took place in the My Lai massacre. Each sub-hamlet varied in size, but usually about 7 to 14 dwellings within that hamlet. And each sub-hamlet was separated by about one-eighth to one-quarter mile from another sub-hamlet. And so the sub-hamlets of the My Lai's that you see here, the six sub-hamlets uh, covered about six square, mi square miles. So that's kind of in your mind's eye, if you can picture that, these little hamlets, that's South Vietnam, okay? They weren't villages per se, they were these small hamlets. We'll talk more about that. It's at the sub-hamlet level where the basic structure of Vietnamese society was to be found. Many Vietnamese never strayed further than five miles from their sub-hamlet their entire life. Ancestral worship was key in sub-hamlet life, to worship those in the family that went before them, and to keep the land as it had been kept for centuries. The sub-hamlet usually was composed of the thatched dwellings used for homes, small vegetable gardens around the dwellings, and then further out, the vast rice paddies, which would provide the staple of their diet and the opportunity to sell some rice within the district to purchase clothes, food, tools, and so forth. Sub-hamlet life was basic to the Vietnamese society, and it was this fact that was largely ignored during the war as the South Vietnamese and American military moved people from areas they could not protect from these sub-hamlets into refugee camps and other strategic hamlets. Those caught in this condition constantly tried to return to their sub-hamlets the area of their birth. Let's talk more about the terrain. The Annamite mountain chain ran the length of South Vietnam from the demilitarized zone up against North Vietnam to within about 80 kilometers south of Saigon. The mountains have high peaks, some more than 8,000 feet, that straddle the country's borders with Laos and Cambodia. The terrain we fought in is as thick as it was high. Double and triple canopy jungle made movement difficult and dangerous. The unforgiving mountains were home to tigers, clouded leopards, various types of venomous snakes, and the well-camouflaged lairs of the North Vietnamese Army. East of the mountains lay the Piedmont, characterized by low-lying hills and small valleys, which are interspersed with tall elephant grass and thick stands of wooded areas. These in turn are interspersed with open fields dotted by small rice paddies. The best way I can talk about the Piedmont, all, all of you that when you've driven south to southern Ohio, like you're going towards West Virginia or south of Columbus, and you get, as you get closer to the edge of Ohio, you see the rolling hills, especially when you're going down to West Virginia and a lot of trees and, and forests on the hills, that's exactly what the Piedmont was like. This Piedmont area was the transition point for the enemy. The Piedmont was, uh, consisted of heavy vegetation which offered a fast avenue of approach from the mountains that allowed the North Vietnamese Army and main force Viet Cong units to quickly assemble troop strength, troop strength and munitions to attack populated areas or South Vietnamese and American forces. So they come out of the mountains where they had a lot of protection 
big camps here. We'll talk about that. We found a number of them. Uh, and then in the Piedmont, it opened up enough where they could quickly move right down into the to lower uh, area in the coastal area, which is where all the population was, and attack the uh, Vietnamese. Most often, these attacks were to interrupt the pacification efforts of the Vietnamese people. So we're moving from west of Vietnam in the mountains along Cambodia and Laos. We go to the Piedmont, and now we're on the coastal lowlands. East of the Piedmont lay the coastal lowlands, which made up much of the land containing Vietnamese population centers and the major rice growing areas. What is pictured here is a Vietnamese refugee camp by the South China Sea on the infamous Battalion Peninsula, which was probably the most heavily mined area in the Vietnam War. And unfortunately, I had to take my platoon there more than a few times. The lowlands offer broad plains of rice paddies interrupted by numerous hedgerows of thick vegetation. This type of terrain bred the threat of the typical gorilla, a farmer by day and a fighter by night. A member of an irregular Viet Cong unit rarely strayed far from his or her ancestral home. Their firepower was not of major concern to us, but they made up for it with their familiarity with the terrain. And that knowledge of the land brought with it the scourge of mines and booby traps from small toe popper mines to the use of mortar and artillery rounds and many undetonated 500 pound bombs dropped from the air. They were all used to deadly effect. The vast majority of infantry battalions in the Vietnam War had base camps or landing zones from which to operate. Each LZ had an artillery battery, which means three, con three artillery guns, usually they're 105 millimeter, for the direct support of its soldiers in the field, as well as containing its supply, maintenance, and administrative functions. The LZs provided a respite for the infantry companies on occasion to return from the field for a rest, showers, some hot meals, and cold beer. Of course, if they were back at the base camp, they were also tasked to guard it along the bunker line, which surrounded the camp. But for us, it wasn't a bad trade to catch some sleep during the day and remain vigilant at night when sappers could attack the bunker line. This was a fair exchange for not humping in the field with a 60 to 70 pound rucksack in 95 to 100 degree heat. Now what you see here is the eastern half of our base camp, landing zone Gator, which is facing the coastal plains and out beyond those coastal plains is the South China Sea. On the small hill to the left, uh, there is a 105 millimeter artillery battery of three guns to support us when we were in the field. For battalion commanders, the drawback to having base camps is that they require troops to defend them. And in our case, one of our four infantry companies in the battalion had to be retained at the base camp for defense at all times. Battalion commanders lost some tactical opportunities to deploy these troops because the base camps had to be defended. So those that stayed at the base camp at night, they were part of the defense, but they couldn't handle it all. So one infantry company always had to be back here. What you see here is the western half of LZ Gator, which faced the Piedmont area. Beyond the tall watchtower on the far side is part of the bunker line, which you, unfortunately you can't see. The radar unit, you, help, you see helped us to identify approaching enemy units at night. To the left of the camera, which is off of the picture, was the landing pad for helicopters to pick up our troops to take them on air assaults to wherever, whatever terrain held the promise of encountering the enemy. Most of the infantry battalion base camps of Vietnam were located in the mountains or in the Piedmont. They were always subjected to a major attack by the enemy but most often, the most common threat were sappers, carefully trained North Vietnamese regulars who wore only shorts to allow their bodies to field the ground in front of them and who would devote hours and hours in the night to slowly crawl through our defensive wires, our trip flares, and claymore mines that surrounded the, train, the terrain beyond the bunker lines. 
Their goal was to get next to the bunkers with explosives, blow the bunker, and rush inside the perimeter to destroy a predetermined target. Sometimes assault forces will crawl up behind the sapper and follow in to make a major attack. Our base camp was hit by sappers more than 10 times when we were in Vietnam. Most attacks had limited success, but one nighttime attack in early May 1969 killed our battalion commander. And he was a uh, uh, black lieutenant colonel, had a great career, uh, one of the few at that rank at that point in time in the Army in the black, he had been a company commander in the Korean War. I was, happened to be in the hospital with malaria at the time. Uh, they came through, they knew exactly where he, his bunker was, and um, they went right to it and threw satchel charge in. He came out of it, bloodied up, he crawled into his fighting bunker, and then they threw another one in there, and that was all he was done. Um, he was from New Jersey, where I'm from, and um, that was in May uh, 1969. In August of 1969, his son, who was in the Marines up near Da Nang, uh, was also killed. So what a tragedy for that family. Each time the enemy sappers who were killed in the attack on LZ Gator were thrown into the back of a small truck and taken to a nearby subhamlet, which was always populated by communist agents. There they would be buried by their comrades. The message we sent was very clear. We would not be intimidated. Now this is kind of a gross picture. I only show it to you to show you that the, all they have on is a loincloth. Sometimes they would even grease up their bodies to, to make it easier to slip through at night. And they were carefully trained and you, you just couldn't hear them. Together, these three distinct terrain environments were a mixture of contrast and contradiction that would try the infantryman's soul. While the terrain was blessed with water of over 100 inches of rain annually, which watered the fertile rice fields, desert-like cacti existed near the swamps and the rice paddies. Temperatures on the coast or in the valleys of the Piedmont could soar to over 100 degrees. Yet the hilltops in the Piedmont or in the mountains could be shrouded in clouds and rain whipped by high winds which drove temperatures to bone-chilling lows. The cold, driving monsoon rain could abu abruptly cause temperatures to plummet, and then after sunrise, rapidly change to zoring heat. These rapid temperature changes, the hedgerows, the elephant grass that we walked through, which could cut a soldier's skin passing through it, just like razor blades, the mountain peaks and the thick jungle strain the bodies of the infantrymen day in and day out. Lean, muscular bodies were daily racked with pain, skin rotting from fungus, and water immersion, along with the ever-present fatigue. The infantrymen trudged on, carrying 60 pounds or more of food, small creature comforts, and enough ammunition to hold their own against the enemy. In the infantry, what you don't carry, you do without. Infantry operations varied based on the enemy situation, the terrain, and the availability of soldiers to meet a particular threat or take advantage of a particular tactical opportunity. Operations often overlap with each other, and infantry battalions were often directed to fight outside their own area of responsibility. Here you see our own area of responsibility from the southern edge of the division's base camp in July all the way down to the provincial capital, Quang Nai, some 26 miles. And this is the responsibility we had. Before we entered Vietnam, our area was covered by a brigade. We're a battalion. A brigade has three battalions. A, a brigade of the South Korean Marines covered the same area that we were left to cover with just one battalion. The inset shows a small portion of the area we were sent to in Operation Burlington Trail, some 30 miles from our home turf, deep into the mountains. The Burlington Trail mission was to arrest control of some provincial roads for the main force, North Vietnamese Army. We also fought in Operations Wheeler and Wallowa, which were combined to destroy enemy forces in the Hep Duck and Quezon Valleys, again, far from our home turf. 
Other operations outside and within our own tactical area were Pocahontas Forest, Golden Fleece, Russell Beach, Geneva Park, and Nantucket Beach. Each are covered in my book and they were unique as far as the objectives and the terrain and the enemy threat the infantry encountered. To understand the Vietnam War at the tactical level, you have to understand these operations at the grass level. In each operation, the infantry battalions were nimbly cross-matched with artillery support and armored cavalry as soldiers traded one piece of terrain for another to defeat the enemy wherever it could be found. And that's the anomaly of the Vietnam War. The infantrymen in the Vietnam War saw three times as much combat as their counterparts, counterparts in World War II. And the reason is we had the helicopter. And so we didn't move by truck, by vast movements, slowly over vast terrain like Europe and that kind of thing. If the enemy was found, the helicopters came in to grab you and you were thrust right into there to fight the enemy. Not unusual, I would be have my platoon in uh, Rocket Valley uh, trying to make sure that the enemy didn't uh, uh, fire rockets into the division base camp and all of a sudden uh, a unit gets into trouble way out in the mountains and they need help and you get a phone call, say, a radio call saying, okay, we're coming in to get you, be prepared, you're going out there to the mountains. I didn't have a map for where we were going. And they said, you'll get a map when you get there. So that rapid displacement of soldiers uh, meant that we could see a lot of combat. It was usually in the mountains or the Piedmont where the infantry encountered major enemy forces. My battalion made numerous air assaults into the mountains and found elaborate North Vietnamese Army base camps, complete with underground ovens, classrooms, stockades for prisoners, and elaborate sleeping quarters. During our more than three years in combat, our battalion also discovered three enemy hospitals in the mountains, including operating rooms, post-triage bed wards, and numerous medical supplies. The enemy's medical staff always pulled out ahead of our arrival with their walking wounded and as much medical supplies as they could carry. Those enemy patients who could not walk crawled out of their hospital just to get beyond the hospital complex to hide and hope for survival to fight another day. What was left for us to find were dead and dying patients, some with arms and legs riding off. And around the camps were freshly dug graves of patients who had succumbed to their wounds. The sure sign that the enemy suffered enormous casualties from American firepower. It was at one enemy hospital discovered during Operation Burlington Trail that I mentioned earlier that our battalion's office, uh, soldiers were most exposed to man's inhumanity to man. Two women were found barely alive in this enemy hospital and emaciated, each of them weighing no more than 50 pounds. At first, our soldiers believed them to be enemy nurses, perhaps stricken by malaria, because they did bring female nurses down from North Vietnam, down the Ho Chi Minh Trail into South Vietnam. But when our interpreter arrived, they told him their story of being captured in their hamlet in the valley below, taken up to the enemy hospital and used for blood transfusions to wounded soldiers just off the operating room table. In barely audible voices, the women cried for vengeance and did not want to be separated from our men who were taking them all down off the mountain to be airlift by helicopter back to a hospital. And they were both uh, survived. I, for my book, I interviewed one of the medics who actually carried one of those women down. And um, she, he was her savior. He's just holding on, wouldn't let go. And he said, no, no, you gotta get on the helicopter to go in. Uh, but that's, that's what it was like. As the war moved on, the tactics began to change especially after the Tet Offensive of 1968, from which the enemy never fully recovered, as long as the U.S. forces were in Vietnam. battalion size search and destroy missions continued, but less frequently. Search and destroy missions morphed into search and clear, clear and sweep, cordon and search type missions. Battalions rarely operated as a whole, 
but more likely their rifle companies operated alone, even in the mountains. And after General Abrams took command in Vietnam from General Westmoreland, the focus changed to pacification, something in my judgment that should have been done in, and put in place from the very beginning. It was not unusual for rifle platoons to be operating alone by 1969, placing out squad size ambushes, and that's the war that I knew. We rarely operated as a company. In 1965, 66, 67, 68, you wouldn't dare put a rifle platoon out by itself. It would have been complete annihilation. By 69, that's what we were doing. And coming out of the ranger school, I kind of like to have my own guys not being told what to do. So uh, it, was, it was much better for me. On occasion, an infantry company would search and clear an area operating together, but only if the intelligence suggested there could be a large enemy force in the area. One of the tactics we developed were hunter-killer teams, fully self-sufficient infantry squads, each possessing two M60 machine guns, a sniper rifle, and lots of ammunition to defend itself if attacked by a superior enemy force until reinforcements could arrive. The teams changed positions every two days but did not move far due to their heavy loads. When spotting small enemy groups, they called in artillery fire, helicopter gunships, or, if close enough, used their own weapons, the M16s. These squad size hunter-killer teams of 10 to 12 men allowed several infantry platoons to keep watch over a much larger area to keep unrelenting pressure on the enemy. And sending a squad or an infantry platoon out by itself, as I mentioned earlier, would have been unthinkable in 1966 and 1967, when the enemy was quite strong. One hunter-killer team was discovered by a large force of NVA regulars and the team quickly scampered into a small or a large stand of six foot high elephant grass where, as luck would have it, there was a depression in the ground that allowed the men to get below ground level. For more than 36 hours, the team remained silent as more than 100 enemy soldiers probed their position with heavy fire. The enemy was reluctant to enter into the high grass without knowing exactly where the team had hidden. The team chose silence over annihilation. And on the third day, they slipped away. I love this picture, and I chose this picture. It was given to me by one of the veterans, and that's what's on the cover of my book. Because to me, it describes the ethos of who we were. Young, youthful guys, all studs, um, not all wanted to be there, but they were there, and they were there to do a job, and they worked together and trusted each other with their lives. So I thought that was a great picture. Eagle flights were also used to great effect. Three Huey helicopters would carry an infantry platoon that would swiftly and effectively search out suspected enemy positions. This use of air mobility made it possible to search as many 10 locations in a single day. So the intelligence folks would say, okay, this subhamlet over here we're getting information from the Vietnamese. There's some uh, Viet Cong guerrillas in here or part of the infrastructure and over here and over here. Here's a paymaster over here. So, so you get a platoon on three helicopters, boom, boom, boom. Just search out the whole area quickly and efficiently. And if, if they ran into trouble, we always had people standing by. We'd have a rifle company saying, you're on standby. You continue to do your job. But if that platoon gets into trouble, we're picking you up and you're gonna pile on. And so it was a very effective way to do things. Our VIP program, which stood for Vietnamese Informant Program, had great success in the populated coastal areas. It was developed by the military intelligence folks and had two purposes. First, to get the peasants to bring in unexploded munitions that they found to keep them from being convert it by the enemy into mines and booby traps. And in return, we gave the peasant an attractive payment. Some would bring in unexploded 105 millimeter howitzer artillery rounds. Every once in a while, you fire those things off or you drop a 500 pound bomb from a, an American plane and they don't go off. And the enemy would grab them. They'd take them to these small hamlets we talked about. 
and it have specially trained men there to take it apart and then re-put it together as a booby trap. So for a 105 millimeter artillery round, uh, we would pay the peasant about $6 in local currency, six American dollars, which was a huge sum for them. And it was a bargain for us. The other purpose for the VIP program was for the intelligence folks to question the populace about enemy insurgents who were embedded in some of the hamlets. The alleged turn-in program was a cover for some peasants who were informants for our intelligence folks. The program worked quite well. Now what is shown here are the results of just one designated turn-in day. Landing zone Dottie was shown here is a small base camp used for artillery support. And LZ Paradise was the location of a Marine con combined uh, uh, action platoon on the coast overlooking the South China Sea. And I was there at LZ Paradise, and that's why we call it a paradise. Beautiful country. Beautiful country. And I went back twice to enjoy the country without being shot at. And uh, so LZ Paradise and LZ Dottie. So look, just one turn in day. Um, 14 81 millimeter mortar rounds, an LZ Dotty, 11 Claymore mines, over 1,200 machine gun rounds, 705 millimeter artillery rounds. When you have a war like this, it gets messy and all this stuff occurs, okay? So on and on and on. And over here at the LZ Paradise, uh, booby traps, M79 grenade launcher, round, three artillery rounds, and so forth and so on. And so when the peasants would bring these in, uh, our informants, they would line up with some of this stuff and come in. So when they walked up to the South Vietnamese soldier that's writing it down what they got and we decide how much to give them, they were actually telling us, this guy over here and this uh, hooch over here, He's part of the underground, the Vietnamese, uh, the Viet Cong underground, or over here, or this and that and the other. So they were not uh, pointed out as being an informant. So it was a nice cover for that. By mid-1970, for the most part, infantry companies ranged far and wide to cover large amounts of terrain. Infantry platoons within those companies often split their forces at night for multiple ambushes. And even nighttime patrolling was pursued in the Piedmont and some coastal areas. The enemy no longer had exclusive use of the night for movement. One tactic that had tremendous effect in the mountainous areas, away from hamlets, away from the civilians, was the mechanical ambush. These involved stringing a series of Claymore mines together off the side of a footpath believed to be used by the enemy. A wooden clothespin with thumbtacks on the two pincers of the clothespin was placed with a sea ration plastic spoon between the two pincers. And then at the end of the plastic spoon, you'd tie a wire and you'd run that across the trail and put it onto a little post. So the enemy comes by, they trip the wire, it pulls a spoon out, then that clothesline makes contact with the two thumbtacks and bluey bluey, the three claymores go off. The enemy moving at night in small groups would trip the wire and, and the thing would explode. And it was not uncommon for a live ambush to hear the mechanical ambush go off in the distance. And at first light, they would find dead enemy, discarded enemy equipment, or mangled flesh with blood trails leading away. So we call this force multiplier. So number one, here I'm talking about the 70, 71 time frame. You have an infantry platoon that's not afraid to go out into the mountains and in the Piedmont. And platoon has about 45 men at full strength. Well, forget it. That never happens, you know, in war. Uh, the most I ever had uh, in my platoon was about 23 men to take to the field. You still have to get the job done. So what we ended up doing is we divide those 23 men in half. I would take half at night on an ambush. My uh, platoon sergeant would take the other half. And then we'd agree to meet someplace else. So you get to this point in the war over in this area here, and you have uh, uh, enemy intelligence estimates about where they're moving and everything up here in the hills. So you put out a, a half of a platoon on a live ambush, and they are required to go out and set up a mechanical ambush. 
and then the other half puts a live ambush in the mechanical. So for the price of one platoon, you have four ambushes. And not uncommon to hear boom in the middle of the night uh, of one of these mechanical ambushes. They became so effective that the enemy, believe it or not, in order to avoid the scourge of these ambushes, they would actually carry flashlights to, on their trails. And of course, we could see the lights, then we'd call in mortar fire on them. So that's pretty much how it was. There are exceptions. You'll talk to people that were over there in the 7071 time frame, got into some major battles, 101st Airborne, way up into the mountains, closer to the North Vietnamese uh, border. But by and large, this is how it was. Vietnamization of the war took on increased importance in the 70, 1970 and 71 time frame. Something, in my opinion, which was begun far too late. Infantry units increasingly worked directly or indirectly with Vietnamese army units or the regional or local force militias. In our area, one infantry company of every battalion had to devote itself to training up the militia who would be in charge of protecting designated refugee camps and hamlets. To accomplish this, the militias, the Vietnamese, were finally given the arms that they needed, American M16 rifles, M60 machine guns, and M79 grenade launchers. The training was tedious and took time, but some units began to show great promise. One drawback was that the American infantry was also there to pick up the slack, and they knew it, and that's something that caused some militia units to be less than ambitious in their training and performance. Again, I'll say it over and over again, we should have done that when the Americans first came over in 1965. And it pains me to give some uh, kudos to the Marines, but the Marines had the right idea because when they came over in 1965, they understood insurgency is in their lifeblood in the Philippines, in Honduras, in Nicaragua, in Haiti. They know that stuff. And so they developed these combined action platoons where they would have Marine squads working with uh, Pluna, platoon of militia, and that's what was needed, and we didn't do that. And Westmoreland, being a World War II general, got into Vietnam and thought, we will win this by total war, just like we won in World War II. Doesn't work. And the first few battles of the war, uh, we had tremendous casualties on the enemy, and w this drove Westmoreland to start looking at body counts. If we can just kill enough of them, they'll kill them in su submission. Well, going through the War College and the General Staff College, I can tell you the body count can be a strategy, and it may work in Europe, but a body count strategy only works when you can kill the enemy faster than their birth rate. Try doing that in Asia. Won't work. In the end, it was our battalion's experience, and I believe the experience of much of the war's effort that the focus was directed too much on winning the war for the South Vietnamese, a la the complete victory we had achieved in Asia in World War II, and not giving enough attention and support to uparm the South Vietnamese military early on with our weapons and with an emphasis of us fighting together with the South Vietnamese forces. In addition, a greater emphasis should have been made by U.S. forces to be involved in pacification efforts early on that would have greatly denied support to the enemy in populated areas. Now, this certainly would not have endeared battalion commanders to that role, because reputations could not be made as fighting commanders by searching and destroying and killing large enemy body counts, but pacification was, in fact, the formula that was needed to win the war. In the end, the American infantry, of which I was proud to be a part of, did everything it was asked to do in Vietnam, and much, much more. The military and political leadership should have upheld their end of the commitment as well. Because in the end, we return home without glory, without a victory, and without sustaining our allies as we had promised. So that's the end of my presentation. I'd love to get into some Q&A here while we have time. I, did, I didn't come here to sell books, but I, I asked them if I could. Uh, this is the book that I wrote, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, 
this is my battalion in Vietnam for the three and a half years it was there. And we had all the experiences that everybody else had there. So historians have said this is a microcosm of the war itself. So if there's anyone interested, you're going to be in the grass with the soldiers for three and a half years. And you can see how when we first came over, we were fighting what we call the war, the big battalions, the search and destroy missions. You pile on uh, with three infantry companies and so forth. And then gradually it went down to search and clear, clear and search, uh, pacification, accelerated pacification, and so forth. It's all here. Um, so I spent eight years uh, working on the book. Uh, interviewed uh, a lot of people in the battalion. I have all the battalion records of the National Archives. If you're interested, if you want to get into the nitty gritty of what it was like to be in the grass, this is here, and I got some nice uh, compliments here. Some of you that have read a lot, some Vietnam book, do you remember Tim O'Brien? The things we carried and all that stuff. He was in our battalion. And he was put in for a, a Pulitzer Prize, and then he also won a National Book Award. He gave me a very nice, um, he's in the book, and he gave me a very nice thing here. This, this is the soft cover. The first two printings were hard cover, and then I did soft cover to get the, but the barcode price for this at a bookstore is $32. I'm selling it for 15 And then, if you're interested, this is another book I published for a friend of mine. He was an artillery officer in our battalion, and um, he had a master's degree in sociology, so after he was, and he's in the book, after he was in with us in the field, calling artillery in on these Vietnamese, killing all the enemy and everything else, they asked him to come back up to the division base camp and be the primary presenter to all new soldiers coming into the division about being kind to the Vietnamese. So it's a juxtaposition there, and so his title of his book is Lamb in a Jungle, Conscience and Consequence in the Vietnam War. And I've, so, I've so, uh, sold quite a number of these to um, college professors who are giving courses on Vietnam because it's a quick read. And it talks about what it's like to fight in Vietnam, then also the quandary he had. Now, we've got to tell people to respect the Vietnamese culture and so on. Now, this book is 1495, uh, but you get the, well, it's not the trifecta, it would be the bifecta. Uh, it's 1495 book cover. I'm selling for five bucks. It's up to you if you like to read it. The, the two very good books. Okay, any questions or comments? I'd be happy to uh, entertain. Yes, sir. Understand you uh, earn a silver star. Can you describe the uh, engagement you're in when you earn that award? Well. In war, you never know when you get up in the morning what your day is going to be like. And um, I won't get into all the details. We, uh, in June, I got there in February, the end of February 1969. By early June, I was the last platoon leader in the company. Uh, the other platoons were run by sergeants. And we were scheduled to get some other uh, lieutenants in. And we had a road clearing operation. There was a road called the Trabong Road. It's, paralleled the Trabong River from Highway 1, which is the main highway in Vietnam, all the way out to the mountains. And in the mountains, right at the base of the mountains, was a Army Green Beret Special Forces camp. So the engineers were there to build up the camp, reinforce it, and they had done that, and they were ready to come out. They knew, sure as hell, if they came out on that road, it was heavily mined. And so the mission was, there were six platoons. We were each assigned a, a, a section of that road to air assault in and then move east. And with, we had engineers with us with mine detectors clear that portion of the road as quickly as possible so the engineers could come out. So uh, my luck, my part of the road was not very well. We were constantly encountering mines and, and everything else. And then south of me, uh, there was a dry rice paddy that went, oh, maybe the distance of three football fields. And then there was a wood line beyond that. And so every once in a while we get sniper fire. And I figured the guy's got to be pretty damn lucky to hit me because he's so far away. So I would get up and walk and, and everybody's looking. I said, all right, get up, get up, let's go, let's go. You know, so I offered myself up for that, for target press, but they couldn't hit me. Anyway, uh, my company commander came over and he said, you got to keep moving, you got to keep moving. We're all running behind. It's like, I can't, there are mines here, you know. So, 
Anyway, there was a helicopter gunship that came over, a Cobra gunship, with a loach. A loach is a light observation helicopter. We used to call it the bubble. You know, you saw plexiglass. Some, some municipalities use it for traffic control in the, uh, in the mornings and that kind of thing. So it was just a bubble. Normally, it's just two people on there, the pilot and the crew chief. So he was coming, and then the, the gunship was following him. It was a light team of only one gunship. So he came over, and he said, um, I hear you're having trouble. And I said, yeah, I got these damn snipers south of me. They're really holding me up. So he says, I'll go over there. So he's, he's going over this dry rice paddy towards the wood line. And he says, oops, he says, I just saw a North Vietnamese soldier go into a, into a spider hole there. And it's like 100 yards away. I didn't see him. And he popped the smoke there. And he says, he's, he's right where I popped the smoke. And I said, oh, shit, that's not good. And what we found out later is they were hiding there waiting for that convoy to come by and they were going to ambush it. So then he goes over the, um, the wood line and he said, I see um, uh, NVA, North Vietnamese uniforms, handing out or, hanging out on a clothesline. I said, oh shit, this is not good. So then he banks in to go for a closer look and all of a sudden I heard his big bang and a fog of black smoke and they shot it with an RPG round and the bird went down and pitched it in on his side. And so the gunship behind that was screaming, you know, bird is down, bird is down. And he's firing up the area and everything else. Well, just at that time, the battalion commander came out with my company commander in a helicopter. Uh, it was like a minute after that bird went down and he landed there and he said, I want you to take men in my helicopter to go in and rescue that crew until I can get more reinforcements. That was not a good thing. And I remember in my mind's eye, the, the company commander was looking at me and he had this look of pain on his face and he didn't say a thing. And I found out later at a reunion, many years later, he, had t he argued with the battalion commander, don't send Taylor in there, you've lost all control. We got more soldiers down the road and armored personnel carriers, let's send them in on tracks. And, uh, and he was overruled. The battalion commander says, no, I'm putting him in. So I took five men with me, we went in there and um, the helicopter went in uh, and the idea if everything works well, which never does in combat, we're gonna jump off, get the crew of that helicopter, get back on and get the hell out. Well, he, they, they came in and they landed uh, and the pilot saw this irrigation ditch so he kind of moved closer to the irrigation ditch so we could get out. I jumped out and then the gunship was behind us and just loaded with his 40 millimeter cannon and everything else. I jumped out the right side of the helicopter with two other guys and I had told him in the bird, I said, we get in there, when we get down there, just get under cover, cover me. I didn't want everybody wandering around. So anyway, I jumped out and that they're firing the grenades all over the place and that kept the enemy down. I went over to where the bird was shot down. The other guys were getting into the ditch, although my machine gunner and assistant gunner that I had told them to get on the bird, they jumped out the left side and they were cut down by enemy fire. They never made it. I mean, just as because they were slow to get out with the, all this equipment and everything. Anyway, I went over there. I found um, the pilot was dead. He was burned up. Um, the crew chief was dead. And I started coming back and then I saw another body there. Well, normally you only have two. There is space for a third person. And as it turned out later, he was in a uh, platoon of um, men that when helicopters get shot down, they're supposed to go in and rescue them, okay? And he was new, and so he was flying on his helicopter just to uh, familiarize himself with the terrain and that kind of thing. Well, he was there, and I went over and I thought he was dead. He was laying flat, and uh, he, I think he could sense I was there. He was shot across the neck and across the stomach. And I'm thinking, well, he's dead. And then I could hear, see his hand move like this. So I think he was too wounded and maybe too afraid to move because the enemy was using him for target practice. And so um, I thought, oh shit, he's alive. And then just, uh, I started like this, AK-47 was firing at me from the bushes. And so I fired back and I used up my magazine and then I reloaded my magazine and because I had a pause to reload the magazine, I got hit right in the left side. And if you want to know what it's like to get hit, it's like getting hit with a ball-peen hammer. And just, man, I went one way, the rifle went another. 
and I knew instinctively it, it opened my side about eight inches. Fortunately, it did not penetrate the stomach. So I knew instinctively there's no way in hell I can stay out here. This was a big guy. If I tried to pull him back, it would be too slow. Uh, so I figured if I run back to the ditch, I'll take the fire off of him onto us, and that's what I did. And I'm zigzagging like this. I yelled at my men, cover me, cover me. And that they, um, they were firing as I got back. And I, when I, just when I hit to the, got to the irrigation ditch, I remember thinking, ah, you bastards, you didn't get me. Thinking this, and bam, I got shot in the lower right leg. Went on the left side, out the right, smashed the tibia and the fibula. And that's, I somersaulted it right into uh, the ditch. And uh, so while all that was going on, my, one of my squad leaders, Randy Bakovich, great guy, he was a surfer dude from Southern California. I still talk to him every June the 2nd. And I have a martini, he has a bourbon on the rocks and because uh, that's the day this all happened. And um, he went out while I was looking around at the, at the helicopter, he wanted that machine gun and it was laying out in the open from the machine gun. They were both dead, but he knew how to, so he ran out to get that machine gun, and here comes a North Vietnamese soldier out of the bushes with the same idea. But Randy was quicker on the draw, cut him down, and grabbed that machine gun. And to this day, he was like, shit, sir, I, didn't, I forgot to get some more ammo. I just had the ammo that was linked into the, I said, what the hell, you don't want to stay out there, you know? So he said, I used it up pretty quick. And uh, they had, um, um, when all this was happening and that bird was shot down, the word got back to the division, and, and they said, oh, yeah, that grid square, uh, we had radio intercepts. There's a radio signal there that would only come from a regimental headquarters in the North Vietnamese. We never were told. We were never told. And so and back in, in that, by that time, you wouldn't, they scattered out, but they had one element of a regimental headquarters there because that, that radio was there. So anyway, um, my other squad leader came over and I was in big pain. And he bandaged my leg. I said, take the boot lace off of this leg. And I could talk about this because it helps me to talk about it. Uh, and he tied both legs together. And he looked at me and he's, this is a young guy, good looking kid from um, Michael Schur from Colorado. He's already enrolled in a college back home. I, I think he only had about six weeks to go in Vietnam. And he looked up at me, he says, don't worry, sir, I'm gonna get you out of this. He caught around in the side of the head and put his hand up to his head like he had a headache and lowered his head and died at my feet. So that left me, Randy Bakovich, the other squad leader, and a radio operator left. And the radio operator um, was brand new to our unit. He was just a dissertation short of getting a PhD in chemistry and he was sent in, I said, what, what professor did you piss off that you got drafted in the army? He says, I don't know how it happened, but I got drafted and everything. So I said, well, I'm thinking the guy's gotta have some smarts to have a PhD in chemistry. So I said, I'm gonna make you my radio operator. So this was the first time he was in the field. And he, he did okay. And then I, I located him. He's down in Texas uh, as, a, as a consultant doing what he always wanted to do. So he made it through. So anyway, finally by then the um, armored personnel carriers came in and got us and took us out. And there were dive bombers flying all over top and once we went out they were dropping. And, and my first sergeant, when he saw me in the hospital, he said there were North Vietnamese soldiers going all over the place. The, the pilots, the Air Force pilots were like kids. There's another group there, boom, there's another group, you know. So we stirred up a hornet's nest. So that's, uh, that's the end of that story. <laughs> Anything else? Come on. Any other questions? Or? Yes, sir. Matt. What are they doing with the... Uh... This is how they um, get the rice. They pick it up here. First, they put it in here, a thresher, and they bang it to loosen the rice. And then it goes through a series of um, ways of get the, the rice grains by themselves. And uh, then they put them in here. It just kind of uh, evokes a picture of the, uh, the Vietnamese... Um, working out in the fields. And as in all wars, the civilians take the biggest load. They suffer the most. Yes.
It, it all depends. It all depends. There was no average distance. If you were doing your job, uh, it was far away. Okay, you, if, you, if you're in the jungle, we talked about the Anamite Mountains, it was close in, always, because the, you, you just couldn't see far. But my job in the uh, infantry platoon leaders was look ahead. We always knew where we were. And, okay, over here I might be ambushed, or over here, and to, do I know where I'm at if I have to call in artillery real quick? And sometimes if we're not near any friendlies or anything like that, any hamlets, and if it looks like there might be an ambush spot over there and I'm, that's where we want to go, I'll call in artillery there ahead of us. How far could you see in the jungle? Uh, not very far, maybe uh, sometimes between me and him. You know, your point men were very, very important and people volunteered to do that. It took a special person to do that. And uh, so if you're in the jungle, you had to stay in real close together and the more you could see, the more you spread out your men. So, it all depends. And we, we had no GPS back then, folks. <laughs> We're putting in a historical display at the Veterans Hall, and uh, the Vietnam display will show my field map and a uh, lensatic compass. And if you didn't know how to read a map uh, or use your compass, you would get seriously lost and probably seriously killed because you had to know. And the maps sometimes were not that great, but they were good enough, and uh, we call in artillery whenever we ran into something, you know. Most of the time we used artillery, uh, helicopter gunships were second, and, and then on a more rare occasion, we, we'd be able to have Air Force planes come in for dropping bombs or napalm, that kind of thing. Mostly it was artillery support. Some more questions. All, all the way down here. Did, did your battalion ever achieve full strength? No. Uh, typical infantry platoon, as I said, is 45 men. Um, we would usually have 23 to 25. Uh, a, uh, an infantry company would have about 165 at full strength. Uh, normally, you'd end up having like 89, 90, something like that, and on and on. So, just the way, and that's the way it is in every war. You know, it, it's not only from illness, uh, from uh, casualties, but also illnesses, uh, and those kinds of things. And there was a little slacking. Sometimes you, you could tell somebody was trying to slack off, and we tried to prevent that as much as we could. Another question, yes, sir. That's a big question. But let's say you were commanding this whole. Or, uh, and now you've got the advantage of looking back on it. How would you have won it? I would emphasize pacification. Number one, we tried to win the war for the South Vietnamese. And that's the mindset of the World War II generals, like Westmoreland. Okay, you can't do that. You can't win it for them. They have to win it for themselves. Number two, the South Vietnamese had World War II weapons, carbines, Thompson machine guns, and the enemy had AK-47s, okay? What we should have done is uparmed the South Vietnamese and spent more time fighting with them and not going in ourselves into the mountains and trying to win this for them. But this was the mindset because that's how we won World War II. And also pacification. The enemy cannot exist unless they have support from the populace. And if the populace feel secure by the host government, they're not going to support the enemy. And that's where we should have been putting our time in, down there where the population centers were. Uh, but, you know, they didn't ask me. I was just a second lieutenant, first lieutenant. You had a question, sir. Uh, probably uh, along those lines. Mm -hmm. At one time, years and years ago, somebody told me that the local Vietnamese didn't care who was uh, who was the enemy or who was the uh, you mm -hmm. know us or their own people or or Viet, uh, Vietnamese. It's true. It's true. All they wanted was stability in their lives, stability in that hamlet. That hamlet meant everything to them. Ancestor worship uh, was very big in the Vietnamese culture. 
uh, they just want to be left alone to live their lives. And whoever could provide that stability, whether it was the South Vietnamese government or the communists, that's what they wanted. They wanted stability. And so they were caught, as civilians always are in war, in the middle. One day the South Vietnamese would be in there, and another day the communists come in. Say, if you support the South Vietnamese, we're going to kill you. And then they leave, and the South Vietnamese come in and says, you had communists in here. Why are they here? You know? And the people are caught in the middle. So it was all about pacification. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Early in the presentation, you had a base camp, and you said you know, it was good to come back and get a meal or mm -hmm. shower or whatever. How long were you gone before you, you said it was at a rotational basis. Uh, it, dep it depended. Uh, early in the war, you probably went out sometimes for a month at a time. Uh, when I was uh, there in 1969, we may be out for like two weeks, maybe three weeks. Two weeks, depends. And then you'd come back. It wasn't quite as, as bad as uh, the in initial thing. And uh, so um, it wasn't too bad. And sometimes we'd get we supplied in the field uh, with some beer and that kind of thing, not very often. Uh, depends where you were, what your mission was, and so it just varied. Sometimes you get back in the field or back in the base camp and uh, uh, then they could get to their mail and I had uh, two occasions my, some of my men got Dear John letters from their girlfriends. One, no, one from a girlfriend, one, the other guy from his wife uh, saying sayonara, you know, we're moving on, so you take their weapon from them first and then you find somebody that's going into the division base camp, which wasn't too far away. They drive up to Highway 1 and, and you get them some booze and you say, just go and drink it off. You can keep the weapons away from them. And then uh, when, when it's over, it's over and he's back in the field. And then his wife or girlfriend's no longer important to him. His buddies are important to him. That's his family. That's his new family. Okay, so I'm not pushing the books. If you're interested or you want to talk some more, I'll be right over there. Thank you for your attention, and thank the good Lord for uh, making it a reasonable night to come out, okay? Thank you.